was smoking all my dragons, divine, righteous, almighty, greats, overachieving, never slacking. We are back. This was a recommendation battle of, uh, I want to say, Towton, Towton, 1461, Wars of the Roses. And we're going to hop right into it. Original link will be in the description. Here we go. Let's learn something. This video was suggested and sponsored by our patron, Jetson. You can join the ever-growing army of kings and generals via Patreon or YouTube membership. Wars often happen because different sides have intractable contradictions, but each new war often creates the causes for the next one. The Hundred Years' War between England and France was no different, causing many conflicts in Europe. In England, the Wars of the Roses stemmed from the Hundred Years' War. The first phase of that conflict culminated in the bloodiest battle fought on English soil, the Battle of Towton. The King of England, Edward III, had five sons who survived into adulthood. For the first time in English history, he created duchies for them, making his sons the biggest landowners in the country. On the one hand, this strengthened the crown, but at the same time it formed a new class of nobility, which had claims to the throne and enough power to vie for it. Five sons sound like every king's dream right there. Edward's son and heir, the famous Hundred Years' War commander, Edward the Black Prince, passed away in 1376, followed by the king himself a year later. The Black Prince's son was crowned as Richard II. The reign of this monarch was tumultuous. The Peasants' Revolt of 1381 was followed by the Parliamentary Crisis of 1386 to 1388. Richard's attempts to reach peace with France, his marriage to the young Valois princess, the lack of an heir, and the constant strife with the nobility made him deeply unpopular. Richard's cousin and one of the most powerful lords, the Duke of Lancaster, Henry Bolingbroke, was exiled to France in 1398. In May of 1399, Richard embarked on a campaign in Ireland, and Henry used the opportunity to return to England. He immediately garnered enough support to dethrone Richard and assumed the throne as Henry IV, the first Lancastrian king. Richard was arrested and died in 1400, while his heir presumptive, another grandson of Edward III, Edmund Mortimer, was bypassed. That cre so basically what we're watching is like the real Game of Thrones. That's pretty much what's going on throughout history. Everything was ge Game of Thrones when you get into the era of all these kings and everybody just wanted to make sure that they stayed in power and rule created legitimacy problems for the king, and he faced at least six significant rebellions. In 1413, Henry IV succumbed to chronic disease, and was succeeded by his son Henry V. The new king was one of the most talented monarchs of England during this era. In 1415, he renewed hostilities with France, and won an impressive victory at Agincourt. In less than a decade, he conquered more French land than any English king before him. The Treaty of Troyes was signed with France in 1420, according to which Henry married French Princess Catherine. Their descendants would inherit the French throne after the death of Charles VI the Mad. Both sovereigns passed away in 1422. Henry V's son, Henry VI, who was less than one year old, was crowned as the King of England. The king's uncle, John... Less than one years old and you are already a king. <sighs> John of Bedford became the regent and took command in France, while his other uncle, Humphrey of Gloucester, looked after English affairs. Although Bedford was a decent commander, the French soon rallied around Jean of Arc, and Charles VII was crowned as King of France in Rheims. Henry's coronation in Paris was a mere symbol. By the time Henry reached adulthood and started governing in 1437, Bedford was dead and the situation in France was untenable. 
The king was weak and easily swayed by his nobles, and at that point the peace party led by Edmund of Somerset and William of Suffolk had more influence on the king than the war party of Gloucester and Richard of York. The sides agreed to peace. That's the worst thing to be to be weak, you know, mentally weak, because it's all it's all psychology. So when your own people can manipulate you or people can manipulate you, period, and sway you a certain way, I mean that's the worst thing for a king to be. Cause you you gotta be you gotta be Michael Corleone up here. At Tor in 1444. According to their agreement, Henry was to marry Charles' niece, Margaret of Anjou, and return men and Anjou to France. The marriage and the peace conditions were unpopular in England. Among those who protested was Gloucester, and that gave Henry a chance to imprison his uncle in 1447. Gloucester died shortly after, and this weakened the war party even more. Richard, who commanded the English lands in France, was stripped of his office and sent to govern Ireland, which was an exile. Somerset and Suffolk became dukes in this period. However, Suffolk was exiled under popular pressure and then murdered. Hostilities with France were renewed and Somerset, who was appointed the commander in Normandy, lost all the northern holdings save for Calais by 1450 and returned to England. He and Queen Margaret had the king under their influence. The prestige of the monarchy was at an all-time low. The Hundred Years' War impoverished England, the losses in France were hard to swallow, and the nobles who had lost their land on the continent were unhappy. At the same time, all the duchies created in the last century had become too strong and independent, and the dukes often had personal retinues larger than that of the king. At this point, it is essential to show you the family tree of the Plantagenet dynasty, as many grandsons of Edward III controlled these duchies, ushering in the era of what is controversially known as bastard feudalism. This era was characterized by the loyalty of the soldiers being to their lords rather than the king. The nobles would use that to procure offices, lands and finances from the king. These lords and their heirs would play a central role throughout the Wars of the Roses. Richard, who had a strong claim to the throne as a great-grandson of Edward III, used the circumstances to return from exile in 1452. Although many came to his banner and demanded Somerset's arrest, the Queen's party was still stronger, and Margaret's pregnancy made her position even more secure. The situation would change in 1453. Affected by the loss of Bordeaux and Aquitaine, the king suffered a mental breakdown and became unresponsive. Scholars still argue about the nature of this illness, but it is clear that Henry VI lost the remainder of his political power. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned as we attempt to... Sound like somebody sent that witchcraft at, the, at him. Made him go mentally crazy. Don't act like that wasn't happening, y'all. Come on. In the north, two noble families, the Nevilles and Percys, used the lack of central power to renew a feud, and as Somerset supported the latter, the Nevilles allied with Richard. By 1454, Richard had enough backing to become the royal protector and appoint his supporters to offices, while Somerset was arrested. However, in 1455, the king recovered, and Queen Margaret managed to influence him yet again. Richard's decisions were rolled back, and he was exiled. This time, the Duke of York wasn't going to take it, and he raised an army to move to London. The conflict that would later be called the Wars of the Roses because of the heraldic badges used by the Lancasters and the Yorks became inevitable. Henry knew that he would receive no support in London, and moved out to a town called St Albans with his 2,000 men, where an at least 5,000 strong Yorkist army was waiting for him. Jeez. Richard wasn't ready to dethrone Henry, so negotiations started, but as the latter refused to surrender Somerset, the Yorkists attacked. 
many Lancastrian commanders, among them Somerset, were killed, while the king was captured. I was just about to say, that had to have been an ugly sight, and then they showed this picture. Ugh. Ugh. And someone had commented on my uh, one of my videos saying they still find swords to this day. Richard returned him to London and was appointed the protector by Parliament. By that time, Margaret gave birth to Edward and became the leader of the Lancastrian party. It seemed that both sides were shocked by St Albans, as hostilities continued only in the form of the Percy Neville feud between 1456 and 1459. Henry attempted to reconcile the parties on a few occasions, but the suspicions were too strong, and in the fall of 1459 the sides clashed once again. This time the Lancastrians gained the upper hand, and the Yorkists were forced to find refuge in Calais and Ireland. The Yorkists recovered quickly, and returned to England in the summer of 1460. The king's forces were defeated at Northampton, and Henry was captured. Richard attempted to claim the throne, but even his staunchest supporters refused. Instead, the so-called Act of Accord was adopted, according to which Henry VI would rule for life, but would be succeeded by Richard of York. The Queen was willing to fight for her son's inheritance, and was gathering her forces in the north. Richard moved towards the Lancastrian troops to prevent their recruitment efforts, but his enemies were already on the way, and their 18,000 blockaded his 5 to 10,000 strong force near Sandal Castle. What happened next is still debated, but the Yorkists sallied out from the castle and were crushed near the town of Wakefield. Richard of York was killed. In early 1461, his son Edward became the leader of the Yorkists. In February, he defeated a Lancastrian army at Mortimer's Cross. Meanwhile, a smaller Yorkist force under Warwick was... Girl, it's just going down. Like, constantly back to back. War. All out war. <laughs> Ain't no peace. Like Defeated at St Albans by the army commanded by the Queen. Henry VI was recaptured by the Lancastrians. Edward learned about this defeat and moved south, where he united with the remainder of Warwick's troops. As Lancastrian soldiers committed atrocities in the area, Margaret and Henry lost all their support and decided to move to the north. That allowed Edward to enter London in March and take the throne as Edward IV. The showdown was imminent. Both sides continued to recruit troops over the next few weeks. Edward left London on the 13th and arrived in Nottingham on the 22nd. Here he received the news that 30 to 35,000 Lancastrian troops commanded by Somerset were to the south of the city of York. Edward had less than 30,000. On the 28th of March... Now this reminded me of this game back in the day called RuneScape. If you remember that, let me know in the comments. You, you, you are uh, the truth if you remember that. King Edward sent Fitzwalter to secure the bridge over the Eyre River near Ferrybridge. However, Fitzwalter was ambushed by Clifford's cavalry. Many Yorkists were massacred or drowned. King Henry had sent a messenger to negotiate, but his offer was refused. Edward knew that the main Lancastrian force led by Somerset was waiting two miles away, ready to crush the Yorkists if they pushed Clifford away and crossed the river. He sent a vanguard under Suffolk, which managed to push the Lancastrians back to the end of the bridge. Edward then marched with the main force to Ferrybridge and led his men personally to Suffolk's aid. To stop the Yorkist advance, the Lancastrians destroyed the bridge, but the former constructed a narrow raft to ferry across. This raft was captured by the Lancastrians, and the fight continued in the area for some time until the Yorkists managed to cross the river to the north at Castleford and set up camp. 
at dawn on the 29th of March, both armies found themselves in a snowstorm. At 11 in the morning, the Yorkists marched northward and in Could you imagine going to war like in a snowstorm? I mean, depending on your tactic, that could it could be great for an ambush. When you read uh, The Art of War with Sun Tzu, he talks about, you know, using the different different elements in uh, weather as an advantage for sure. So that could definitely be a tactic of war camped on the hill 10 miles south of York, with their backs to the village of Saxton. Edward put his men in formation. Their lines stretched for a mile along the ridge. At the same time, the Lancastrians moved north and took positions to the north of the Yorkists on high ground 100 feet above them on the Meadowland to the south of Towton. Part of their cavalry was hidden in the forest to the west of the Yorkist positions. The Lancastrians had the advantage of the high ground. The Yorkist position was shaky, as any retreat would trap them along the river. Edward had artillery, but the weather conditions did not allow its usage. Somerset didn't want to descend from the high ground, and waited for the Yorkists to approach. The battle started with archers exchanging volleys. However, the wind was blowing into the face of the Lancastrian archers, and they were unable to see the enemy properly. Their arrows fell short of the mark, and according to the sources, all they could hear through the whirlwind was the laughter of their counterparts. A hail of That is insane. Could you imagine that? It's like you just entered Hell's Gates at that point. You're just hearing laughter. That's of counter volleys accompanied this. The Yorkists were gathering thousands of enemy arrows and were firing them back at them, retreating after each volley to avoid the return fire. The Lancastrians suffered heavy losses and were forced to descend from the hill, taking up melee weapons and charging. The Yorkist archers sent a few more volleys and then retreated behind their men-at-arms. As the main Lancaster force charged into the Yorkist army, a fierce melee began across the line. At the same time, the hidden flanking force attacked the left flank of Edward's army, did significant damage and almost routed it. Edward himself led the reserves and stabilized the situation on the left side. Still, the Lancastrians outnumbered their enemies and slowly pushed them back. It was then that the forces sent by Norfolk to assist Edward arrived. It is not clear if Edward gave an order or if the commander of this unit took the initiative, but these troops attacked the Lancastrians in the flank. Soon Henry's forces were routed. Sources claim that 20,000 Lancastrians and up to 10,000 Yorkists were killed, making Towton the bloodiest battle fought on English soil. Henry, alongside his wife and son, escaped to Scotland. Edward IV's position was strong for now, but the Wars of the Roses were just starting. We are planning more videos about the Wars of the Roses down the line, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This nasty work, guys. I ain't gonna lie, nasty work. Um, you don't realize how, like for me personally, because I was never like growing up. I liked stuff like the three hundred and things like that. Definitely was obsessed over the three hundred, Leonidas and you know all that. But I was never really too into like the medieval scene until I watched Game of Thrones, like. Even with them saying, uh, what was it, the the Lancastrians reminded me of the Lannisters. And, but um, it's like, when I, I remember when I first put on Game of Thrones, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to like this. There's no way I'm going to, like, I already know. But I'm like, you know, I'm going to just try it anyway. Ended up getting obsessed by the time I got to, like, episode three, four, five. You know, I was it was just a wrap. But you don't really realize how messed up these wars are. Until you like watch TV shows like that or The Last Kingdom, all those shows based on medieval times and you see just how 
just how brutal it was. Like when you when people are letting these arrows go, it's hitting anywhere. It could go through your eye, it could go through your your face, you know, somewhere in your nose, just anything. And some people have sur actually survived that. Imagine surviving something crazy like that, like at your ear getting hacked off or something, and or your arm getting chopped off, and they, they not even having a type of the medicine that they had today to even relieve, relieve that pain. I mean, we're talking in just a whole nother level here. Um, humans, humans have did some wicked stuff, man. Like if you've seen, I'm going to go back to Game of Thrones, Ramsey Bolton. If you've seen what he did with like, uh, with Theon, when he turned him to reek, then you realize just how psychotic some of this, you know, like this stuff was really wicked back, man, it was wicked back then. But it's like, like in America, what this teaches me, right? Even though like, you know, in school you learn about a lot of stuff, uh, but, um, you know, growing up in my schools, public schools, like it was, it was, I was distracted a lot. So there was a lot of information that I missed on due to being distracted. So it's awesome that I get to come, I get to watch these videos. Just imagine how much information I'm learning right now, you know, or reviewing and learning just by sitting patiently watching this, these videos while a lot of other people my age are worried about other things, right? I, I get to be in school again. So, and I, and I learn better like this anyway, without the classroom setting, just, you know, I learn better like this. But um, this also shows me like, cause in America, you have a lot of people who are like, yeah, you know, when they talk about like, what happened to the Native Americans or tr the transatlantic slave trade? Oh, they were already killing each other. They were already killing. This teaches me, no, everybody was clearly, you know, because in Africa, they had their wars going on. They was doing what they was doing. You know, China, you know, th there's actually that new show. Um, I forgot what it's called. I think it's that, it's that based in Japan. I'm not sure if I think that one might be based in Japan, but everybody was like having these crazy just wars like humans were wilding out, bruh. Wilding, man. Spazzing out. You know, imagine how many of them souls still wandering. Haunted lands all over the place, man. But with that being said, original link will be in the description. And if you like this video, definitely stay tuned. I'll be back with more. Much love.